Hello, everyone. Today's reading is from Acts 2, verses 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Awesome. Thanks, Marith. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Doing pretty good. Good to be here. Got some exciting things coming up at church, hey? We've got... Oh, there's a computer noise. Uh, looking forward to our birthday celebration, four years old. I know, we've got a Christian comedian. I booked him, so, you know... It's, <laughs> If it's an absolute tragedy, you can blame me, I guess. But he's a great guy. He's a pastor up in Newcastle. And he, he thought one day, he's like, what would it take? He was sitting in a cafe. And he thought, what would it take for my neighbor or for these people to come to church? And he, he's trying to bridge the gap between the community and the church. And hey, that's what we're on about. So invite your friends. Hey, we've got a comedian coming to church. And I think it's going to be great. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be fun. We've got a jumping castle. That's for the kids. Okay, I'm sorry. And the puppets here as well is for the kids, but it's going to be awesome. And Baptism Sunday, cannot wait. It's going to be awesome. You know what? If it's cold water, we're going to wear wetsuits and we're going to grin and bear it. Don't let that deter you. Oh, that's going to be an awesome celebration. I just got back from uh, base camp, men's convention, it used to be called, but now it's got a cooler name, base camp. And it was so good. Some of the boys have come back as well this morning here. Some, some we've left up there still hanging out. It's such a good time. Um, we're going we're gonna to be doing it again next year, and uh, we're going to get some more men there. So men, I've got you in my sights, okay? You're coming next year. It's, it was a great time. Jim, wasn't it great? You better just nod and say yes now. Yeah, okay. It was awesome, and uh, yeah, just encourage you guys to get there. We've got a year to prep for it, so that's okay, but it's going to be great. That's what I'm going to be talking to you about, men. Looking forward to it. Okay, this morning, let me ask, have you ever been part of something from the beginning? Okay, thanks, Paul. It was a rhetorical question, but thanks. No, that's all right. That's all right. Just answer it. <laughs> from the ground up, right? Have you ever been part of something really from the beginning? It can be super exciting. There's energy and there's all this possibility. It can be really scary as well, okay? But it can be really exciting. All this possibility. One day there's nothing. The next day there's something. It's exciting. I don't know about you, but this attracts me. And I love origin stories. You know, I love these things like... T books or, or, or TV series or movies with origin stories of things beginning. My, Pippi and I just watched this show, uh, where are we, called uh, We Crashed. Have you heard of it? It was pretty weird. Like it was, it was, it was follows the, um, the, it traces the story of WeWork, right, which is a, is a company and, and its founder, Adam Newman. And I tell you what, it's a weird and wonderful story. Like it's out there. No doubt this guy, Adam Newman, very flawed man. Like, he just, lots of broken bodies and broken pieces along the way to get to where he wanted to go. But you can't take away from the guy, he was a visionary. And he started with a blank piece of paper, which was, how could he re revolutionise the, the office environment? And that's where we work and what so and so forth came from. It's an interesting story, right? I, personally, I'm just drawn to these narratives, right, of of stories where something comes out of nothing. Now, when we started this church, we had a blank piece of paper. Now, obviously not entirely blank, you know, had a bit of an idea of what we want church to be about. Everybody comes to the table with their own preconceived ideas and, and experiences about what church could be. But really, we, we started with a blank piece of paper. What do we want this church to be about? We ask those questions. What, what do we want our values to be? What do we want to be known for? When we gather like this on Sundays, what do we want to do? 
How are we going to reach the people of this area with the good news of Jesus? It was exciting times. And I'll tell you, the passage that we're looking at today really informed us, taught us a lot about who we want to be, what we want to do, what our values could, should be in the church. What we're witnessing in this short passage that Mrith read for us, it's the church of Jesus Christ being born. It's the birth of the church of Jesus Christ. What did they do? What were their values? What were the priority principles of the early church? What can we learn? It's over 2,000 years ago, but, but so relevant. This is God's word, so relevant to us today. What can we learn? I think there's three things. And let's ask them, you know, let's look at those things with questions, just to, to help us stay awake over the next 25 minutes or so. What can we see? We're going to answer three questions. What was their source of authority? What was their source of authority? And how do they interact? How do they treat each other? What did that look like? And then lastly, where did their power come from? Right? What was their source of authority? How did they interact with each other? And where did their power come from? And while we're doing that, we're also going to answer those questions for ourselves. So are we ready to dive in? Let's look together. What was their authority? What was their source of authority, the early church? Let's have a look at our first verse. Verse 42 in Acts chapter 2. As Paul mentioned before, we are in this series called, I Will Build My Church. Those are the words of Jesus taken from Matthew chapter 18. They're not my words. I'm, we're going to build Harborside Church. We're not that kind of church, putting quotes up of the pastor like that. These are the words of Jesus. I will build my church. The gates of hell will not overcome it. Acts is that story. We are looking at the book of Acts, fifth book in the New Testament. It's the history of the church, volume one. Super exciting. This term, we're looking at, uh, at chapters one through nine. Right now, we're in the second half of chapter 2. And we're asking, when the church started, what were they on about? What was their authority? Let's have a look together. This verse, really, the whole sermon's on this, okay? Aren't you lucky? Just one verse. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. First thing we're told is they, that is, the new believers the early church, have devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, as we know, right, there's, they didn't have this back then. They didn't have the, the New Testament yet. Of course, they had the Old Testament, but the New Testament was not written yet. So the apostles were responsible for laying down the teaching, the authority of the early church. And lucky for them, Jesus had prepared them for this very task. After his death and resurrection, before his ascension into heaven, he spent 40 days with the apostles, proving to them that he was alive. It says, with many proofs. I love that. Like, Jesus, are you really? Yes, yes, I am, I promise. Proved to them and taught them all about what the kingdom of God would now look like. He, he prepared them for this. It's central to who they are as a community, right? Right? And it carries weight in the life of the gathering, the apostles' teaching. Now, what does that mean for us? Now, this might sound bleedingly obvious. I'm going to say it anyway. We here at Harborside Church have complete trust in the Word of God as the ultimate authority in this church. Now, we stand with Christians throughout the ages who have taken their lead from God's Word over anything else. Now you notice, what word is described? What, what word is used to describe the early church's attitude to this authority? Have a look there, second word, what is it? This is not, you can answer. It, do, yeah, you're too scared because I told you <laughs> off, I know, I'm sorry. Don't want to be pointed out. <laughs> devoted, right? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. It's not begrudging, tolerating, apathetic, right? The word used is devoted. Now, what, what sense do we get there, right? Well, we get a sense it's, some, it's significant to them, 
right? It's important. It holds a special, it holds a revered place. Don't you think you just get the sense that the early church, they're, they're hungry. They're hungry for God to speak to them. Sitting at, I can imagine, sitting at the feet of the apostles, listening, hungry, longing to hear what God has to say to them. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it? It's a beautiful picture, and it's something I'd love to see reflected here. You know, this is my, my prayer for Harborside Church, that we wouldn't just put up with, you know, wouldn't just endure or just give some attention to God's word, but we'd be hungry for it, that we would desire to hear from God. I've got to admit now, for, for quite a while, I've been not just a fan, but a devotee of coffee. Okay, I'll just admit it to you, all right? It's confession time. You know, I'm just, not just a fan, I'm a devotee. That's just a nice word for an addict. <laughs> it is. I'm dressing it up. You know, when I don't have it, my body reminds me to have it. Yeah? Where's that headache? Oh, yeah. Why am I having the shit? Now, don't judge me. I'm seeing some judgmental face. Come on. I reckon 50% plus in this room. Yeah? Thanks, Michelle. At least I'm getting a nod. Thank you. Yeah, it's not just me. Have you ever tried quitting sugar? I've done that a couple of times. Mistake? No, it's not. But it's tough. After two days, it's hard. Your body craves it, right? Your body craves sugar when you go without it. Your body craves caffeine when you go without it. May we long after God's word in the same way. And when we go without, we feel like something's wrong. Let me ask you, what's your attitude to God's word today? What is your attitude to God's word? Nice advice or authority for life? Big difference. There's one example, but when the message is about to be preached to church, you're getting ready for a nap or you're getting the notebook out. Now, that's just one example, right? The Sunday sermon. It's just one short time throughout the week where the Bible is central, but it's, it's significant. Let me ask, what's your attitude to God's word? If you yourself right now are feeling apathetic to God's word, I urge you to pray for a renewed hunger for his word, for his way in your life. Friends, I'm not here to condemn you today. What I'm here to do is point you to the God of all grace, the God of redemption, the God of mercy, the God who longs to answer prayers like, God, fill me with a desire for your word. That's a prayer he loves to answer in the affirmative. So, may we be a church that's hungry for God's word, gathered and also scattered. We're committed to God's word being at the center of our meetings, right? And our very lives. But it's not easy. It's not easy. And I think we're going to have to fight for it. We're going to have to fight for it because if it's not the Bible, if the Bible's not central to who we are as a church, then, then what is? I saw this cartoon and it made me laugh. I don't know if you can see it. This is the fictitious quiz show called Facts Don't Matter. I'm sorry, Jeannie, your answer was correct, but Kevin shouted his incorrect answer over yours, so he gets the points. <laughs> right? Now, this is totally silly. But isn't this kind of true in our culture? Really true about social media, amen? Doesn't matter if you're right, you just got to be loud and confident. Too often, it's the loudest voice that wins. And let's not fool ourselves, it can happen in the church too. The loudest voice wins, the, 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 someone who is the most persuasive. But that's just somebody's opinion, right? Are we going to let God's word or somebody's opinion 
be central in our church. Again, another prayer. May we let God speak and may we listen. Why? Because God's word has power. Okay? I don't want to disappoint you, but my words do not have power. Okay? Your words do not have power. God's word has power. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. It's been said, you don't read the Bible, the Bible reads you. It's powerful. God's word's powerful. Human opinion is not. Only when it's based on God's word. God's word's powerful. I love this quote by the great reformer Martin Luther. He knew this to be true. He said this, The Bible is alive. It speaks to me. It has feet. It runs after me. It has hands. It lays hold of me. So true. The Bible is no ordinary book. Let's let God speak, hey? And shape us into his transformed community. Right. So, what other questions are we answering? What was the early church? What was their authority? It was the apostles' teaching, right? God's word. What other questions are we answering? How did they interact? How did they interact? Let's have a look at our first verse again. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer fellowship. What does this mean? My mum grew up going to fellowship. It's what they called youth group back in the day. Bit of a dorky word now, isn't it? Fellowship. We lived in America for a while and after church you'd spend some time with people. You'd go to their home or maybe a Bible study and they'd say, that was a sweet time of fellowship, y'all. You know, <laughs> and it's just, it's just as an Aussie, Aussie, you cringe, right? It's so dorky and so daggy. But May our modern interpretations not fool us. Because it's a powerful word, right? Just because we think it might be a bit dark. It's a powerful word. The Greek word is koinonia. And what that means, it's just, it means in common or sharing, right? Participation, a life lived in common and in unity, And what do they have in common? Remember last week we saw the church of Jesus Christ is totally diverse. It's beautiful. The Christian, the the church is the most diverse, multi-ethnic thing, movement in all of history. Did we saw that last week? It's amazing. And yet there's incredible unity. What do they have in common? Same Heavenly Father, right? Jesus Christ, their Lord, They've received the Holy Spirit. God is their heavenly father. Incredible. So now they're adopted into God's family. They're family. They've just got a whole bunch of brothers and sisters. Friends, look around. Your family is huge. You now have a massive family. If you're part of the church of Jesus Christ, you've got a whole stack of brothers and sisters. And you can't choose your family. Even if you might want to. Too bad. Warts and all. So, how should family treat each other? Verse 44, let's have a look. These next verses, I think, expand on what fellowship means. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God. And enjoying the favor of all the people. It's beautiful words, aren't they? Isn't it a beautiful picture? Is there a part of you that thinks, I'd love to be part of something like that? Is there? I think we should be careful not to overly romanticize the early church. They had problems. You just got to read 1 Corinthians, Galatians to know they had lots of problems, just like us. So don't worry. They weren't perfect. But what we have here is a pretty beautiful picture, right? And these, these verses are beautiful, and they're also kind of disruptive, don't you think? This is what happens when 
People take God's word seriously and they're filled with the Holy Spirit. So what do we see? First thing we th- I think we see, what does fellowship look like? It looks like radical generosity. We see that? Radical generosity. They had everything in common, we're told. They sold property to give to anyone in need. Sounds radical. Sounds beautiful. Also a little bit weird. Dave, what are you getting at here? Is this like, we're talking hippie commune stuff? I've been doing some research this week. I found a tract of land up north. (laughs) What do you reckon? You up for it? Rob, you up for it? Let's do it. Okay. No, thanks. I don't want to live in a hippie commune. So what do, we, what do we take from this then? What we're seeing here, it's not an early form of communism. Not at all, okay? Why? In communism, peace, people are forced to do away with individual ownership. That's not what we're seeing here at all. What we see here is voluntary. It's very clear in Acts 4 and 5 that Christians, they were entitled to own property. This is choice, yeah? This is their choice. It's radical generosity. You can't have radical generosity if it's compulsory, right? Right? No one is generous with their taxes. You pay what you're told. Yeah? Radical generosity. It's only generous if it's voluntary. Now, what we're seeing here, as I've already mentioned, it's the outworking of changed hearts, isn't it? These people we saw last week, they've been cut to the heart when they heard Peter preach about the risen Jesus Christ and what it meant for them. They've been cut to the heart. What should we do? He said, repent, turn to Christ and be saved. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And now, guess what? Changes everything. Changes everything. When you become a Christian, everything changes. We talk about it like the gospel lens, like, you know, putting on a new set of glasses Being a Christian, it affects everything we do, how how we operate in our marriages and our friendships and our workplaces, and it also affects how we view our finances. You can imagine the early church, right? Some wealthy folks have become Christians, and they're thinking, we've got these pieces of property. What do we do with them now? I'm not sure we need them, particularly when they're faced with people in their community that have nothing. Hey, should we sell? Hey, honey, should we sell? I think we should. Let's sell this and give radical generosity. It's beautiful, isn't it? This is the concept of giving in the New Testament, right? What's the concept? We are free to be as generous as we want to be. That's the concept. It's simple. It's one word. How should we think about giving generosity? Right? There's no duty and compulsion at this church. You know, we don't check your pay slip versus your bank account versus what you give. Okay? It's none of my business. Absolutely none of my business. I will never ask you what you give. I'll just look at the statement. No, I'm kidding. I, it's none of my business. I don't want to know and I don't know. It's between you and God. Well, what's my job then? To talk about it like this to give you the principles of the New Testament and ask yourself before God, God, am I being generous? Change my heart. We're not talking about compulsion or duty, right? We give because we've got a changed heart. Now, can I just say a little bit here? As I've gotten older, I don't think duty and responsibility are necessarily dirty words, right? You know, if I'm a member of this church and the roof's caving in or or we need a youth minister, I'm thinking, I I need to play a part in that. It's not some rich people outside the church can help. Yeah? There's a sense in which I I take responsibility. I'm a member of this church and, you know, I want to be a part of that. So I think there is a little bit of what you want to call duty responsibility. But generally speaking, generosity. Recognising that, you know what, it's all God's anyway. Recognising there are others in need who could benefit from our generosity and recognising it really is more blessed to give than to receive. Uh, Let me just say, I, I do genuinely believe this is a generous church. I do. Amen. A generous church. I also believe we can stretch ourselves. And guess what? 
we are going to be giving ourselves opportunities to stretch ourselves this year. Stay tuned. You excited? I can tell you are. Stay tuned. All right, what else does fellowship mean? Amber, would you mind just passing that water? Thank you so much. I'm just feeling a bit parched. Thank you. What else do we see here? We've seen what does fellowship mean? It means radical generosity. It also means radical community. These people were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were also devoted to each other. They were devoted to each other. What we see in, the, in this, the early church, a beautiful picture, like we've said, of a Jesus community. We shouldn't romanticize it too much. But man, I want to be part of something like that. They use the word, what is it? Devoted means they were committed to each other. Let's ask the question, what does it look like to be committed to each other? What does that look like? Well, what do we get from the passage? We see they met together. How often? Once a month? Every day in the temple courts. They met together every day in the temple courts. So let me take this opportunity to um, announce that we are changing our service times from Sunday morning to every day at now. We're not going to do that. But wow, every day in the temple courts. They met publicly like that every day in the temple courts. They also met inside their homes. We can see that, right? Breaking bread together, eating together. We can see that. And I think you get a sense here that it's difficult to participate in community at arm's length. Don't you reckon? You cannot break bread with someone if you're not in their presence. Can't do it. It's got to be close up in each other's homes, in close relationship. Okay. What if I told you, what if I told you that I had found a miracle drug? I've been doing my research, church, and I have found a miracle drug. It's going to improve your health and well-being a lot. You interested? I know you are. Mossman people, we're all up into health and well-being. Got your attention? Cool. Harvard School of Public Health professor Tyler Vanderweel and journalist John Seniff wrote a piece for USA Today titled, Religion May Be a Miracle Drug. Okay. They conducted their own studies, incredibly in-depth, collected a stack of data. Their findings were fascinating. They outline that even just going to church reduces people's mortality rate by 20 to 30% over a 15-year period. Research suggested that those who regularly attend services are more optimistic, have lower rates of depression, are less likely to commit suicide, have a greater purpose in life, are less likely to divorce, and are more self-controlled. Church is the miracle drug. Come on. (laughs) Do you believe it? (laughs) Get involved at Harborside Church. Increase your lifespan by 20 to 30%. (laughs) That's going to be the new banner on the website. We should print it on the front door as people come in. Welcome. Extend your life. Hey, eternal life. (laughs) Right? It's a pretty good selling point. Come to church. Increase your life span. And I think, you know, let's face it, right, a big reason behind these positive results, why? Because church pushes us towards people. Church pushes us toward relationship, and it's good for you. It's almost like God knew what he was doing. So weird, so wild. It's how God designed us. You know, most of the New Testament is written to churches, And the church knows nothing of the solitary Christian. You know, I don't know if you've heard this. People say this to me every now and then, if not all the time. Yeah, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church. I'm a Christian, but I just kind of do my own thing. Like, you know, I'm sure there's reasons for that. And I don't want to throw those people under the bus, absolutely. But let me just say, the Bible knows nothing of the solitary Christian, right? Living outside a Christian community doesn't even factor in to the equation. 
You cannot do it on your own. You were not meant to do it on your own. We were made for community. Okay, Christian community is good for our spiritual and our physical health. And notice in the passage at the end that Ruth read for us, it's attractive to outsiders. Did you notice that? The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. A loving community with radical generosity, it's attractive and it draws people in. It is our greatest evangelism strategy. Love each other. What did Jesus say? They will know you are my, my, they will know you are my disciples by how you love each other. It's always been our prayer that people would experience our community and then say God is really in this place because they see how we love each other. Is that what you want? It's what I want. May we work toward it with God's power. So God clearly teaches being part of a local church community. It's key to the Christian life. Don't give up meeting together, the Bible says. You need each other. And weird, secular science, modern psychology, recognize being committed to a group of people long term, it's part of living a flourishing life. Wow. So let me ask you this. What could be our hesitation? What could be our hesitation? Why do we still struggle to commit to each other? Why do we... <clears throat> why are we quick to avoid being bound together in community? I've been thinking about it this week. I think there's one very simple explanation, a sad one, but here it is. We believe the lie. We believe the lie that we are better off having choice over commitment. It's a lie. The Bible says it's not true. Secular science, modern psychology says it's not true. But I believe it is the lie of the evil one, of Satan. I believe he loves to isolate people, to try and trick us into thinking that, you know what, keeping our options open is, is the best thing to do, rather than committing to a bunch of people. Even when faced with evidence like the loneliness epidemic that we are going through, and I think we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg right now, even when facing that, we still value choice over commitment. It's not better for us. Don't think you're being clever. Yeah, I'll, I'll come to church, you know, once every sort of, I don't know, four, five, six weeks and dip my toe in, but then I also do other stuff, you know, like I'm, I've got it covered. I'm smart. It's not smart. It's not good for you. Don't give up meeting together. Why does the Bible say it? Because people do and we struggle. And I get it. Post-COVID, it's a weird world. We're in terrible habits, right? I, I understand. But the truth is we can replace those habits with habits that nourish us. We can. And we can trust God at his word when he says, don't give up meeting together. What would it take for us to trust God at his word here? To follow the example of the early church, to be devoted to a group of weird and wonderful people. That's you. I didn't mean to point to you when I said weird there, okay? <laughs> I know we're weird and we're dysfunctional and you may not have chosen to hang out with these people, but let me tell you, that's the beauty of the church. And that is also... An incredible evangelism tool because people come in here and go, hang on, there's, there's people who are like 80 plus years old and there's people in their 20s and these people are friends and, and but there's, these people are from different backgrounds and yes, that's unity and diversity. May people come here and say, God is really in this place. This is different to the surf club. Those things are wonderful. Those community things are great. But they don't have what we have. May we pray for a heart that is devoted to each other. Amen? Yep. Amen. Okay, let's finish with our last point here. Where did their power come from? We looked at, what's their, where's their authority? We looked at that. We looked at how do they interact with each other. And let's finish on this. Don't worry, not long to go. Where did their power come from? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. The early church devoted themselves to prayer. 
They'd received forgiveness of sins, gift of the Holy Spirit, were enjoying fellowship and unity, and they knew full well where the power of all of this comes from, God himself, his spirit. And at a show of unity, they bow the knee in dependence on their Lord and Saviour. They seek him to guide them, sustain them, strengthen them, nourish them. Not that long ago, I turned up here on a Sunday morning and I was first on site. I'm not always first on site. This particular Sunday I was. I thought, okay, I'll, I'll go around and do all the things that need to be done. Turn on the, the, flick the switches for the lights and the sound and all that kind of stuff and nothing happened. Ugh, this old building. Flicked on the power, the sound and lights, nothing happened. Now, you are all so lucky that your pastor is really handy that I... <laughs> you know it's a lie. You know me too well. I'm thinking, oh, man, I don't know what to do. I hope Paul Robertson or someone turns up who's handy, can help me out here. I, you know, I'm just standing there thinking, okay, what do we do? If this can't be fixed, how do we do church this morning? Can we? Can we do church without the heating, without the sound, without the lights? Thankfully, someone turned up who knew what they were doing and fixed it, right? So we didn't have to go through on some of those thoughts. But it got me thinking, what could we do without a church? Truth is quite a lot, you know? I think we could do without media and sound and lights, they just make life a bit easier and they do help our gathering. Are they central? Well, no, we could, we could do acoustic version, we could light a fire in the middle here to keep warm, you know. We could do church under a tree, let's face it. We could, much of the world does. But it made me think about it, right? What could we do without? Let me say, church ministry, the Christian life, without prayer, it's far more difficult than doing church without electrical power. It is, because it is the real power. Now, it's easy to say that, but it is true. Prayer is the real power. Moving forward in the Christian life and in church ministry with prayer, it's like trying to scuba dive without air. You won't last long. All the best. You know, there's been a lot of talk about Australia moving toward more electric cars. I think, awesome. But you know what? If we don't build the infrastructure for charging stations, it's not going to help very much, right? Because Teslas, I mean, how cool do they look? Pretty cool. But without power, they're just a nice-looking shiny metal box, aren't they? They are built to go somewhere to be filled with power. The church of Jesus Christ is the same. A church that doesn't pray that doesn't rely on God through prayer, it might look nice, and you all look pretty nice. It might look nice, but it lacks the power of God. Let me say it's possible, it is possible to do church and the Christian life without prayer, but not for long. And what might look pretty soon becomes pretty ugly, I think. Because here's a great point. Every time I read this quote, I'm, I'm convicted. We must also pray for this reason. Pastor and author Tim Keller says this. God asks us to commit to prayer. Why? Because he knows that it is very dangerous to give us very many good things unless our heart and spiritual vision is prepared through lots of prayer. That's convicting. Because the truth is, church... That we are, that you are, a very capable bunch of people. You are. Flattery will get you everywhere, right? We are a, a very capable bunch of people at this church. And because of that, we are in danger of receiving God's good gifts and patting ourselves on the back for them. Yeah? It's dangerous. It leads to pride. All sorts of trouble. May we never rely on our own strength to build this church. Psalm 121, verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, 
Its builders labor in vain. What would it look like for this church to be devoted to prayer, devoted to God's word, devoted to radical generosity and radical community, devoted to prayer? What would that look like? Now we pray as a church. We gather here at nine o'clock, half an hour before the service to pray. Everybody's welcome. Come join us for prayer. As, as we pray for God to move in this service, as we pray for lives to be changed, come join us at nine. We pray then. We pray during the service. We pray in our small groups. We pray as a staff team. Hey, we encourage you to be prayerful in your individual devotional lives. But if prayer was foundational for us as a church, what could we expect? What should we expect? Let me ask you. We, we, did, we run these... These prayer nights, we call them kingdom come nights. If prayer was a foundational value for our church, would you expect less than 20 people or more than 20 people to be showing up to those nights? Wouldn't it be awesome if we put these kingdom come nights on and they were the most attended thing we did? Because as a church, we knew that trying to do church ministry, that trying to fulfill the mission without prayer, it's like scuba diving without air. You can't do it. Wouldn't it be awesome if we gathered together on those nights and in a show of unity bent the knee and said, God, we need you to fill us, to empower us for our mission here. You know what? I could end this message with an inspiring and uplifting story. You know, about a group of people that really prayed. And when they did, God answered their prayers in amazing ways. I've got that story right here. But I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do that. Instead, I'm going to ask us to pray right now. That's what we're going to do together. We've got some time. We are going to pray. Because we can talk about it. You can have me talk about it. But it feels weird if we don't then pray. What could we pray for? We could like pray for all the stuff we've just been talking about. Wouldn't that be weird? (laughs) Hey, no, seriously, could we pray that God's word would be the authority of this church, but more than that, that we'd have a hunger for his word? Could we pray for that? In, In many and varied ways, could we do that? Could we pray that we would be known as a church that was devoted to each other. Imagine if people in the community talked about Harborside and they said, they really love each other. They they are generous people. How good would that be? Could we pray that we would be a place of prayer? That we pray big prayers, that we expect God to answer, so we're going to do it right now. We've got two roving mics. Stay in your seats. Leslie and Paul are going to be roving with the mics. And if you want to pray, stick your hand up. For everyone else, we're just going to bow our heads, close our eyes. But stick your hand up. A mic will come round. Pray in a big, loud voice. Can we do that? Yeah, let's put this into action. Okay. Going to spend some time praying. Let's do it. Thanks, guys. Heavenly Father, thank you for the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, that those who believe no longer have the weight of your wrath resting on them, but you have taken your wrath upon yourself and your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, might this truth be the joy of that fact that unites us, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord God, I pray you'll put it on our hearts to know you better, to study you deeply, and to live that out in community. I pray, Lord, that we will be a welcoming place where people want to come in and feel connected, and there are opportunities for people to draw nearer to each other and draw nearer to you. Lord, I pray for revival in Mossman and the local area, that people will come to know you for the first time and that others that aren't walking with you will see what's happening around this church and in the hearts of people here and want that. 
that they will want you, Lord. Amen. Uh, Father in heaven, thank you for today and this beautiful message that um, Dave has uh, spoken uh, to us in regards to devotion. Uh, teach us to fall in love, fall in love with your word and uh, also to action it uh, so that in our lives uh, as we walk through today and for the week, that when we even have um, adversities, may we find joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, we pray for this community. Lord, may we be a community that encourages community, Lord. Let us pray for each other and let us pray for one another that we will see each other and that we'll encourage each other. May people who walk through those doors and people who see us on the streets be encouraged to meet up with us and also meet up with God, Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Harborside. We thank you, Lord, for the vision that um, you gave to Dave and Pip in the beginning. And, Lord, we're just so, so thankful for our community here, Lord. Help us to grow as a, as a faith family to each other, irrespective of our age or where we come from. Lord, help us to um, model this to our children and to bring them into the fold and to show them how to live in a church family. Lord, give us um, the hearts for prayer and devotion to one another. Give us some um, hearts for generosity. Lord, help us to be devoted to your word. We thank you, Lord, for Dave's leadership and clear message. Lord, we thank you that you can speak to us so clearly through the Bible. And Lord, we just um, we raise up our church to you. We thank you, Lord, on our knees for the blessings that are just so overwhelming from a building that this community has come together. Keep us strong, Lord, and keep us focused on you. Amen. Father, I thank you for Harborside. I thank you that um, this is a, a church that you're building. And um, let's pray that you would put within us, a, a, put within our heart, Lord, a, a desire to be committed to the basics. Father, to be devoted to your word, to, uh, to fellowship, Lord, to the breaking of bread, and Father, to prayer. So I ask uh, for all of us here that call Harborside home, Lord, home, Lord that um, those would be things that are foundational to us. Um, we ask it in, in your son's name. Amen. Yeah, Father, I just yeah feel deep conviction in my heart right now. Just and I want to repent for independence where I haven't pressed into your word and really sought your face and just justify it by busyness and yeah, I just want to say, Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. You're welcome to move. We need you to move in our hearts and to awaken us, those of us that are sleeping in our spirits and our souls, that you would move, that you'd be given permission to do the work that you want to do in us and draw our hearts towards one another, that we would really love each other sacrificially, that we would see each other, that we would see the needs around us and just be moved by what you want to do, that we wouldn't resist you. And yeah, I just want to repent for my own resistance and just ask that you would come, that you would move in this church, and that it would be so attractive to the community that they would see that and that they would be drawn in and that they would be moved by your spirit as well. We just need your help in this Holy Spirit. We ask that you would come. Thank you, Lord, that where two or more are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst of, of them. So, God, we thank you that you're here this morning. Uh, I just pray that our love would be patient 
and sincere and kind and that we would not hold a record of wrongs. I just pray that you would um, create in us a clean heart, oh God, this morning in each one of us. And I just thank you, God, where, you know, as we draw near to you, you draw near to us. In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for the opportunity to be together this morning and to think about these things. Lord, we, we don't want to stay the same. We want to change. We together want to admit that often we don't want to sit under your word because we want to go our own way. And that is, unfortunately, sometimes that the nature of our, the posture of our hearts, would you change us by your spirit to delight in your word, to delight in what you have to say to us? Lord God, we do ask that we'd be a church that is known in this area for generosity and for how we treat each other. Hey, may we be filled with love and good deeds for people who are not part of this church, but may we especially be known by how we love each other, in kindness, in patience, in bearing with one another. And Lord, it's a beautiful moment here as we've prayed together. May that continue. May we show our dependence on you in prayer. And we pray all this because you died and because you rose again, Lord Jesus. We pray this because you are the true senior pastor of this church. You lead this community of people. And may we listen to you. May we be led by you to be a light, to be a city on a hill. In Jesus' name, amen.